Hello and welcome to another Knit365 vlog. My name is Martin and I live in Cardiff in South Wales. Today it is Monday the 22nd of March and it is my non-work day, also known as my knit day. And I'm recording a mini blog podcast update to you uh, about the Argyle sweater that I've just cast on for Mark. Um, this won't be um, a really long video, at least I don't think it will be, because I'm just going to sit and chat to you for a couple of minutes about the project and more importantly, talk about my approach to intarsia knitting, because that's how we do the colour work. So it's a mini project vlog of sorts, in as much as this video will just focus on that Argyle sweater pattern. Um, and I hope that you enjoy. I chose this um, pattern to talk about in this video because in my last catch up, which was my sort of February roundup and cast on plans for March, Lots of people um, commented below. Thank you very much if you did leave me a comment. Um, there were lots of comments around um, how I approached the intarsia method. I talked a little bit about intarsia being, let me show you with the pattern. So intarsia, you would usually have a different color ball for each color. And usually you would have a, a small little ball of yarn or you can buy actual bobbin holders and you sort of wind, wind some yarn, wound, wind the yarn on the bobbins and then kind of just leave the bobbins dangling down the back of the work. And I don't do that method. I did do that previously. And then Jenny from my local yarn shop, Ammonite Yarns in South Wales, I was getting in a bit of a pickle and I was moaning about the fact that I wasn't enjoying working on this project. Um, it was the jumper I had on in the last video. Very warm spring day today. I'm in a t-shirt. It's too hot for, for woolies. Um, Jenny said about not having the bobbins and having long lengths of yarn instead. And I mentioned that in the last video and a lot of you commented um, asking if I could talk about that in a little bit more detail. So we'll come on to that in a moment. All will be fine. Please don't scream. Yes, we have a knot, but it's an intentional knot. We'll we'll get there in a moment. So um, this is the Argyle sweater by Martin Story, a lovely um, traditional Argyle style with the crisscrosses and the pa and the uh, the sort of diamond shapes. Um, without giving the pattern away, you can see it's a lovely little V-neck sweater, and I'm making this for Mark. He chose the wool, which I showed off in the March video. So hop back if you want to see that. I've just realised I don't have the ball band with me. But it is Jameson's, I believe. I'll pop the details on screen below. But it is a merino silk alpaca blend. And it is just, it smells lovely. I know we all smell wool. It smells lovely. It's so soft and squishy. And I've done the rib. And I have started the Argyle pattern. Um, and I've now got fur, uh, wool in my mouth. Right. The one thing I wanted to mention, um, it is absolutely nothing to do with the pattern, but I thought it was useful to kind of call out how I approach some of my projects. Because this pattern actually um, fits from a chest 40 up to a chest 48 in inches. Now, I believe a chest 40 is a small. Mark is an extra small. Um, I have talked in the past about how Mark is a joy to knit for because he's an extra small. His clothes take literally half the wool and half the time than it takes for me to make something for myself. But this jumper is only um, in a small. Talk to Mark about it. He said, well, I'm not gonna wear it if it's gonna be too big. You know, I like clothes fitted. I said, well, I don't think I can make it then. He said, well, can't you just adapt the pattern? Yeah, of course I can. Um, so I sat down, I got some measurements out, and I spoke to Jenny and Ruth from Ammonite Yarns. I kind of did my calculations and I rang them and I was like, can you just check my maths for me? 
But actually, it is quite logical when you think about it. And I just wanted to share this with you because I don't know... Lots of you are all probably now going, oh, yeah, Martin, it's easy to adapt a pattern. But there may be some of you that have never thought about doing it in this way, either to size down or to size up. Um, and all I did was I didn't swatch. I still haven't swatched. I've just cracked on. It'll either fit or it won't. And I'll, I'll check it halfway. Um, but I say that, and I should probably put a caveat now. Generally speaking, my knitting is neither too loose nor too tight. If anything, I'm ever so slightly loose. Um, the, the last project I made for myself, my gauge was out by about one to two stitches, which I think gave me about an extra inch. And for me, that's fine. That's kind of an extra inch of ease. I, I'm fine with that. But I do understand that I don't swatch and it is my own responsibility. <laughs> and if I get to the end of a project and I was making a glove and I've got something the size of a blanket, then that's my own fault. But we digress. Those of you that swatch, well done. Polish the halo. Those of you that don't swatch, don't let the little swatch man on your shoulder say, oh, you should swatch. Because it works for some and it doesn't work for others. And that's fine. However, back to me adapting my pattern. I looked at the number of stitches that you needed to cast on. Um, and let's just for ease, because I won't give the pattern away. Let's just say I needed to cast on uh, eight stitches for the small size. The medium size was actually uh, 10 stitches, but the large size was 16 stitches. So you can see how the increments go up depending on the number of stitches that you cast on, obviously, for the size that you want. But what I was able to do was actually look at the schematic, and I, I'll show this, I don't think this gives anything away in the pattern. Most patterns have this kind of schematic that tells you um, what the finished item will be and actually the finished front will be 22 inches for the small size but Mark actually wanted it 20 inches so I needed to lose two inches of fabric to make it the size for Mark but back to my eight stitches 10 stitches 16 stitches when you actually then look at the cast on numbers for the 22, the small, it's actually 22 and three quarters for a medium, then it's 24 for a large and so on. You can roughly work out how many stitches there are per inch without swatching. And um, in this pattern with this wool, it's a four ply wool. So it's small and it's knit on three and a quarter mil needles. Um, eight stitches gives me one inch of fabric. So I worked out my maths. I worked out that I would need to cast on 16 less stitches following the small size in order to make an extra small. So that's what I've done. I got Jenny and Ruth to check my maths and all I've then done, very quick preview, there's the pattern. Um, I've made sure that I looked at the actual pattern grid and I've come in to make sure, because obviously it's a V-neck, so to make sure that the center still lines up, um, I took eight in eight stitches off each. So rather than just losing 16, I've made sure that it's still even. Um, and the one thing that we did, we did the rib. And then I actually, um, when I was halfway through one of the rows of ribs, it was effectively on two needles so that I could stretch it out. I made sure that um, we got a jumper for Mark that we know is a, a really good fit. And we just gave the rib, because obviously the rib bunches up on the needle, we gave it a little tiny stretch just to make sure that it would be as he would wear it. Um, and I laid this jumper on top of another one and it's the same size. So, so far so good. I've adapted the pattern. I worked out how many stitches per inch and then I adjusted the pattern accordingly. Obviously, I'm gonna to need to make some other adjustments as I'm going because I'm gonna to need to bring in at the sleeves and then bring in at the neck. And of course, I have less stitches, so I'll follow the broad principle of the small, but it may be if, for example, it tells me to do six decreases overall on the armholes, I may actually only do four or five because my, my fabric is generally smaller, so I have less. If I do six, it might be a bit more severe. So there's a few more adaptations I need to make as I'm going along, but 
so far so good in adapting the pattern. Um, now, I'm just gonna have a slurp of tea and then we'll get to the mess. So, Intarsia, um, yeah, bobbins. This is how you usually would knit Intarsia. And I, I'll pop a, yeah, I'll pop a picture on screen now. This was, would you believe it? This was only my second ever project. Um, it was a Justice League scarf that I made for my middle brother. Um, my very first project that I ever knit was a blanket for my first niece. And my uh, first niece of my younger brother, my middle brother then was like very tongue in cheek, obviously. But it's like, oh, well, if you're making stuff for the baby, well, are you going to make me something? Make me a scarf. OK, so he found me a pattern. He, went, he said, you can't make this, can you? Challenge accepted. And I didn't know how difficult Intarja was. Um, I think as a new knitter, I just saw a pattern that I liked the look of and jumped in with both feet. Got the pattern, realised I didn't have a Scooby-Doo what I needed to do. Um, and actually at the time, Lynn off the Calon Yarns podcast... Um, I'll pop Lynn's details below. I love Lynn's videos. Um, Lynn actually had a bricks and mortar um, knitting shop in Cardiff. So I popped along. I saw Lynn and I had a very mini um, intarsia lesson about how to wind up the little balls and how to pick up the yarn because you, you bring the yarn. I'll show you in a moment. You bring the yarn underneath so that you don't get a little hole. So effectively the yarn twists itself. And off I went. And that that worked perfectly for me. Um, I was making um, individual squares. They were probably yay big. It wasn't particularly complicated. They weren't big. They weren't unwieldy. And the bobbin approach worked great. A few years later, the jumper that I had on in my last um, video, which if this is your first time watching, hi, I will just pop that on screen now so that you can see the jumper that I was wearing. That was obviously a full-size jumper, lots and lots of colour changes, and I was finding the bobbins, I keep wanting to say balls, the balls kept getting knotted together, the bobbins, whatever you want to call them, just kept getting entwined. And I'd spend so much time having to stop knitting to untangle them, to get them all neatly lined up so that I could then carry on. And as I said in the um, introduction, um, Jenny, um, probably sick of me moaning in Knit Club on a Tuesday night, if I'm honest, said, why are you doing it that way? Why don't you try it like this? And this is what I now do. Um, I was about two thirds up the back when Jenny suggested that I change my technique. I did that and then I whipped through the top and then I managed to do the front and the jumper didn't actually take me that long. But you have to be brave everybody because the long lens which I will show you in a moment can end up looking like this now imagine though that this was a series of bobbins and a series of balls that's hell of a mess you're going to end up cutting them off in frustration and starting again but what the long lens enable you to do is pull each thread to untangle it very easy because they're not joined together so as long as you don't like scrunch this up and you're you're quite gentle with how you move this around project bags are brilliant obviously to help make sure this doesn't get into a unwieldy mess but here i'm just about to start my my row again and i'm in a bit of a pickle so i can take my first long length and i can just pick it up and there it is and then i can take my next long length and I can pick it up and I can pull it out of the ball and there it is and for me there will be lots of pros and cons of both ways I'm sure and some of you will be experienced in Tarja knitters and I'll show the technique in a moment um, I'll, I'll, I'll start a few stitches but you can see the ball pulls up it's all a bit of a mess but if you just give it a very gentle pull it comes loose and for me it's 
the better technique for being able to manage so many ends all in one time without getting into a complete pickle um, and slowing your knitting down. And that's basically all I do is each one of these is obviously for the colour change and I just make sure, drop the actual knitting, I just make sure that I, every couple, I don't even do this every row, every couple of rows, I just come through and when it gets into a bit of a knot, I tend to do it on a knit row. So I have all the line, all the wool now lined up neatly. So it will be perfect for the first one. Um, and then Intage is a bit fiddly on the purl row because you're obviously knitting in a different direction and your bobbins do get into a bit of a pickle. Your bobbins, your long lens do get into a bit of a pickle. And that's what causes the little bird's nest of a knot. Um, but it just, it takes a bit of time, but I think that's the thing with Intarsia. It's it's designed to be easier colour work because there's no floats. You're not carrying yarn as you would traditionally in a fair isle style. Um, you are working with um, an individual colour per individual bobbin. See, so there I've just pulled two through at the same time. And then all I would do is they're, they're kind of the same length. Um, when I came to add them in, I just off the ball, just pull a bit, break it off, add it in. So I will end up running out of colours as I'm going. Um, I will sort the ends out on this first um, bottom line at a later date. I wanted to make sure that they were in and the pattern was established. Um, in one of my um, West Knits shawl videos from last year, I talk about a technique that Stephen West uses that he calls the Weave and Stephen, which is where you introduce a new yarn. And similar to in crochet, when you um, you crochet in the tail as you're, as you're going along, you kind of wrap the tail into the stitch. Stephen does something similar with knitted yarns that you would um, knit the tail in with the next couple of stitches and then you can just snip them off. Um, I will do that intermittently as I'm going. Um, some of these are a little bit more tricky than others because um, with the fair isle technique, I don't have a lot of room so here for example I've got a new I've got a separate thread for this orange for example but I don't have a lot of room to sew in the end um, to make it sit nice and neat so I may just end up sewing in some ends at the end but I hope that helps clarify what I mean by using long lengths of yarn um, and you can see once you've kind of done it, I haven't finished them all, so I'm not going to show it all that. It still looks a bit messy, but most of them are now free to move around. And as you can see, they kind of line up quite nicely. Um, so that's the long lens. And then let me just show the actual intarsia technique. Now, you're going to be looking at this this way because um, I think it's too diff I I find it hard to knit. I'll see if I can get a bit of footage going the other direction as well. But um, actually, it might be easier for you to see it from the back anyway. So what we are going to do is, for example, I knit. Uh, so I previously knit four with this light grey. I'm now going to knit five so I can move the cream along. And by doing this as intarsia, I now need the cream. So I drop the grey and I pick up the cream, but I pick the cream up from underneath the grey so that the cream comes up over the top. And then I drop the cream. And then this one I'm not doing quite, quite as intelligent because it's only a tiny little bit. So it, ignore me, you, you would usually pick up the next colour. I'm going to use the same. Um, but when we get there now, so I'm now going to introduce the dark grey. 
this isn't showing up very well, the dark grey and the light grey on the camera next to each other. But I would drop the light grey. And look, there's the dark grey waiting for me. So I then knit the number of stitches that I need in the dark. Da, da, da. Which the pattern should be quite straightforward because it's, it everything shifts along once shifts along one. So there's the final stitch in the dark gray. And then I drop the dark and there waiting for me is the light gray. And then you get the picture. So every time you have a different color within the pattern, you have a different bobbin or a different piece of yarn. So um, again, now this gray stitch here needs to become a cream stitch so I drop the gray and then there's the cream waiting for me so it's very good because the the colors are always there when you need them there's no floating so with a traditional fair isle style pattern I would have ended up carrying the floats along the back whereas you can see we don't have the floats you have the sort of the inverse of the shape and that's basically all the intarsia technique is now this is a much more complicated one as i said because the way the argyle works you have so many different colors of length um one of the options i did consider was not doing the crisscross and just knitting it very simplistically with the squares and then French darning um, over the top of the stitches. So you, you effectively create the V for each of the individual stitches by hand sewing. I did contemplate that, but I thought it might, you've got to be perfect with your French darning to make sure that the Vs stand up correctly um, and actually feel part of the fabric. So even though this is a bit more tricky, um, I'm much happier with that as a technique. Um, so we will do the V's as we're going. We'll effectively make sure that we're, we're changing colour. Um, so that's it for this little mini project vlog. I talked about how I downsized the pattern. I've talked about my approach to the intarsia. And I've talked about the bird's nest. Um, but if you are um, if you are a knitter that has worked with Intarsia before, I would love to know how you do it. Are you a long length of yarn or are you a bobbin? Um, are you something else? Is there a third way that I've not considered? Um, and I said, I don't think there's, the, the thing I love about knitting is there's no right or wrong way with anything. There's no such thing as the knitting police. As long as you get done what you want to do, and you're happy with the finished article, then that's all that we can ask for. Um, so for me, certainly with the, the complexity of this pattern, I'm much happier doing it with long lengths, even if it means I've got to manage the bird's nest. Um, but certainly if I was doing the superhero scarf again, I would absolutely um, be doing them with little bobbins because I think it is just a little bit easier. And you only have two colors, maybe three colors, um, on the go and it is blocks of colour so you are carrying the yarns less whereas with this you can see all of the different yarns here because effectively I am having one yarn for every single time I change colour but I think slower in the long run but I think I would be happier with the finished article so there we go um I am gonna edit this together, very quick editing hopefully, I just need to uh, pop a couple of pictures in and then I'm going to get this video uploaded. Um, I said I today is my knit day, I work a nine day fortnight so I'm very fortunate to have every other Monday off work. So it is mid-morning, I'm going to do another couple of rows on my jumper here and then I'm going to get out in the fresh air and go for a little walk and then I have finished uh my mittens 
if you watched my February roundup and my what am I doing in March. Um, I finished my mittens, um, but I've got some ends to sew in on those. So I might um, take those with me and sit on a bench and have a coffee somewhere on my walk and sew in some ends. Um, and yeah, that's about it. So um, if you were a returning viewer, thank you so much for coming back and giving me a little bit of your time today. If you were a new viewer and you just stumbled upon me, you are very welcome. I post at least one video a month with my roundup of what I made the month before and my plans for the weeks ahead and try to intersperse that with some more project specific videos such as this. So you are very welcome. If you've liked what you've seen, give me a thumbs up and please click the subscribe button. It doesn't cost you anything to subscribe but it helps me to grow my channel. And we are so close to hitting the 1,000 subscribers, which is just a fantastic milestone. And we've got some lovely giveaways coming up, which I'll talk about in next month's video, which will be out in a couple of weeks time. So please leave me a comment below. Let me know what you think of this video. Any color work, tips and tricks are greatly appreciated. So we will leave it there. And until we speak again, happy crafting.